Welcome to a profile of STS-51A, the ultimate shuttle mission. In this video, I'll make the case for that title, and you can tell me whether you're convinced by it in the comments below. The mission was conducted on Space Shuttle Discovery and launched on November 8, 1984 at 12.15 p.m. UTC from Launch Complex 39A at Cape Canaveral. The commander of the mission was Frederick Hawk, who was on his second space flight, having been the pilot on STS-7. Prior to joining NASA, he had been a Navy test pilot, Hawk would later command STS-26, the return to flight mission after the Challenger disaster. The pilot on this mission, David M. Walker, had also been a Navy test pilot. He was on his first space flight of four, and his next mission, STS-30, would deploy the Venus Space Probe Magellan. Mission Specialist 1 was Joseph P. Allen IV, on his second and last space mission after previously launching on STS-5. He was a nuclear physicist and was selected as a scientist astronaut. Anna Lee Fisher was Mission Specialist 2, and she had a background in chemistry and medicine, specializing in emergency medicine. This was her only space flight, but she worked for NASA on various projects, and had been working on Project Orion before her retirement in 2017. She was also the subject for one of the most iconic astronaut photographs, which you can easily find on the internet by just searching for Anna Lee Fisher. The final crew member of five was Dale Gardner, the third mission specialist and also a Navy man. This was his second space flight after a stint on STS-8, and was also his last. The goal of the mission was to deploy two satellites, ANIC-D2 and SYNCOM-4-1, and then retrieve two satellites, Palapa-B2 and Westar-6, that had not been placed into their correct orbits because their solid rocket motors had failed. This was the first mission in which such a plan would be attempted, and the space shuttle was uniquely the only space vehicle ever in operational use that could do it. While other capabilities of the shuttle, like servicing the Hubble Space Telescope, could plausibly be done by an Apollo spacecraft docking with an equipment module in the place of the lunar module, which could carry the parts necessary, only the shuttle could bring one large satellite back, much less bring two back while carrying two others up. The two failed satellites had been launched by STS-41B, and after their failure had been noted, the owners of the satellites had claimed the insurance on those satellites. The insurance was paid, leaving the insurance companies the owner of the derelict satellites. The insurance companies then commissioned NASA to bring the satellites back so that they could be resold. You see, before the Challenger disaster in 1986, the shell conducted commercial missions and bursts on it were for sale. That arrangement was essential to the economic viability of the shuttle, bringing in lots of cash. After the Challenger disaster, politicians were convinced by private industry to prevent the shuttle from carrying any more commercial payloads so that the other rocket lines like Delta could be restarted. Without that prohibition, a mission like this, where the shuttle was deploying and retrieving easily more than a billion dollars worth of satellites, could certainly justify the shuttle's costs. This was Discovery's second launch, and its first launch was STS-41D, in which it deployed three satellites. During its first year, Discovery launched six times, a shuttle record and unprecedented for any spacecraft before or since. This was easily the most productive mission of the six, but the last one did involve not only the deployment of two satellites, but also the in-space repair of a satellite. Missions like this showed what was possible with the shuttle, but that potential was cruelly cut short in the haste to launch Challenger on STS-51L. One of the satellites launched by this mission, SYNCOM-4-1, was actually the first one designed specifically to take advantage of the shuttle's large bay. The other satellites featured in this mission were primarily designed for the Delta or Atlas rocket lines. The successful recovery of two satellites was not all that made STS-51A unique. It was also the first and only time the manned maneuvering unit, the MMU, was used operationally to aid the success of a mission. There had been an attempt to use it on STS-51C, but that didn't go so well and they decided to just use the shuttle's robotic arm. Before STS-41C, a spacewalk without a tether had been conducted as a test that was STS-41B, and after the Challenger disaster, the MMU was deemed too dangerous to use. It was replaced by a different system called SAFER, but that was only tested and reserved for emergencies. It was not used in regular mission use. The Soviets had their own similar unit, the SPK aboard Mir, but that too was only tested and not used practically. So this mission, STS-51A, was the only time a tetherless spacewalk actually worked for a practical purpose. 
The plan to retrieve Palapa B2 and Westar 6 was simplified by the fact that they were basically identical and were under control from the ground. Before the shuttle was launched, Mission Control used the satellite's onboard control thrusters to bring them back down to an orbit where the shuttle could access them and had them ditch their faulty Perigee kick motors. On each satellite, there was still another solid rocket motor, the Apogee kick motor, meant to circularize their orbits at geosynchronous altitude. The plan was for one astronaut to stand at the end of Candarm and manage the top end of the satellite, while another astronaut maneuvered to the ap Apogee kick motor of the satellite and stuck in a harpoon known as the Stinger, or more prosaically, the Apogee kick motor capture device, into the nozzle end of it so that it could be secured to the cargo bay safely. For Palapa B2, Dale Gardner was on the arm while Joseph Allen used the MMU, then the two switched places for Westar 6. The first EVA lasted 6 hours, while the second one took 5 hours and 42 minutes. Unfortunately, using Kerbal Space Program to simulate this mission, I couldn't quite figure out how to make the stinger-wielding astronaut thing happen. So what you'll see here is a more automated method of grappling the satellites using the indomitable claw, somewhat tweak scaled smaller. I tried other grappling devices but they couldn't keep a hold of the satellite during re-entry while the claw did. After recovering the two satellites, the astronauts held up a for sale sign, delighting the insurance companies but leaving mission control characteristically unamused. And in fact, both satellites were resold. Indonesia bought back Palapa B-2 and was launched as Palapa B-2R on a Delta 6925 rocket in 1990. Westar 6 also launched again in 1990 as Asia Stat 1, with a Long March 3 bringing it to orbit. The mission came to an end with a landing at Kennedy Space Center lasting just 15 minutes shy of 8 days. The landing features at the beginning of the IMAX film The Dream is Alive, an optimistic documentary on shuttle missions made before the Challenger disaster, though the audio during the landing is from SDS-41B, the mission that had launched Palapa B-2 and Westar 6 in the first place. Thank you for watching this profile on STS-51A.